We talked about Super Tuesday at the top of the show, but that's just about the only thing that's made a dent in media coverage of COVID-19 or coronavirus. On Wednesday, the governor announced New Mexico has a few hundred test kits provided by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, with more hopefully on the way soon. Meanwhile, the state is trying to work with a private lab to develop testing sites across New Mexico. In New Mexico, two people had been tested for the COVID-19 virus as of midweek, with one negative result and one pending. And more tests are being done now. NMIF senior producer Matt Grubbs has more with one of the state's epidemiologists. Dr. Chad Smelzer is a medical doctor. He's also the deputy state epidemiologist, which means that he is a very busy man. So we appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in. Certainly. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Um, first, I want to start in the context of our discussion today. Um, we'll say things like COVID-19 and coronavirus. It, can we consider those as the same thing? Well, we should really say novel coronavirus or COVID-19. Okay. And okay. the reason for that is there are coronaviruses that circulate that cause the common cold. This is a bit more severe than those. Those occur each year. Okay, okay. Um, who is most at risk right now for catching novel coronavirus? Well, technically speaking, if you have a new virus and there's not a lot of immunity in your population, everybody's at risk. Um, that doesn't mean that people need to panic. And as a matter of fact, the governor's message yesterday was an excellent one. It's not time to panic. It's time to be prepared. So people um, can all catch the disease, um, and there are certain people in the population who will be at more risk for severe disease. And who are those people? So if they catch it, um, who are those people who would be more at risk? Okay, so the people that are at more at risk that we've seen around the world, as well as in the United States, are um, people at increased age, people who are immunosuppressed, and s folks that have certain comorbidities or other diseases that cause them to be more susceptible. Okay. So lung diseases, um, anything that makes you immunosuppressed. Can we say um, something as general as kids or the elderly? So what we know from the initial studies in China, about the first 44,000 or so patients, 80% um, of those, I believe, were in the age of 30 to 79. So we weren't seeing a whole lot in the younger population. I do want to stress that that doesn't mean the younger population can't be infected. So everybody needs to be prepared. Um, but again, as the governor said, it's not time to panic. Um, given that, are you concerned at all about um, the run on things like N95 respirators or hand sanitizer? It is true that we've had some supply chain issues. So a lot of those products are produced in China as well as some other countries that have shut down shipping those products. However, the, the federal government has taken some steps in the United States to increase production domestically. Um, we also um, have a Bureau of Health Emergency Management that's surveying our healthcare facilities at a regular basis um, to assess how much they have, what supply do they have on hand, and then assisting those that have a shortened supply with how to order new ones. Okay. Um, are there things we can do instead? Well, yes, and uh, again, the governor gave a great message yesterday about ways to prevent respiratory pathogens and how they spread in, the, in our communities. And that is to, you know, monitor yourself for illness. If you are ill, we recommend that you don't go to school or to work. Stay home if you're ill, as well as washing your hands regularly. It's very important to wash your hands. I think you mentioned uh, a run on products. There's been quite a run on hand sanitizer. Well, you don't need hand sanitizer, although it is effective. You can just use warm water and soap, and you need to wash for 20 seconds or more and make sure you get in between your fingers and your thumbs. Okay. Those are the most commonly missed parts of your hand, um, and wash for an extended period, and do that regularly. Uh, what does regularly mean to you in the context of a well, day if you're at work? Of course, when you're before and after you're preparing food, as well as, of course, when you're after you use uh, the bathroom. And then if you're in public places, uh, um, it's good to wash your hands regularly. There isn't really a definition of regularly, but frequently during the day is a good idea. So if you're touching things like a lot of doors, um, if you're pumping gas, things like that that other people are touching. That's correct. And so you, you want to just be wary of, the, of how, you use and what you how you use your hands and what you touch. And then another way people spread disease commonly is they touch other people or a surface and then they touch their nose, their eyes, or their mouth. And so people do need to be aware of that. And it's good for respiratory pathogens, so respiratory illnesses at any time, um, to not um, you know, touch your nose and mouth um, and eyes as much as possible. 
Okay. Um, we heard yesterday that the state has, yesterday being Wednesday in the context of this interview, um, the state now has a few hundred um, COVID-19 testing kits. Mm -hmm. um, more are expected. Um, do we have enough? Well, I want to make it very clear. The important point here and the good news is the, the state has the capacity to test. We also have the capacity to send tests to the CDC if we need backup. So we have, in our minds, an adequate amount or capacity of testing, and we do expect to receive more. Okay. Um, is there something, can you, you know, can you develop your own? I've, I've heard that um, research institutions like the University of New Mexico Hospital um, uh, might develop their own tests in a normal situation. Is that something that's being considered? Yes, and that's a great um, point that you're making. Um, I, in New Mexico, we have a very good, or a, an advantage in some respects, um, because our biggest uh, reference laboratory is very close to our state public health laboratory. We have a strong working relationship between the laboratories, and we've already been in discussions for some time now with the reference laboratory to develop commercial testing in the state. Okay. Are, are there standards, you've worked for the CDC, you told me, are there standards that the CDC has for developing tests that prohibit that right now? It does not prohibit that right now, and there are um, active involvement of in, uh, the federal agencies in order to, um, it's what it's called is a laboratory developed test, um, or an LDT, okay. and they are, um, there are movement around the country at different refer reference laboratories, excuse me, um, to develop these tests. Okay. Um, what do you need from the federal government right now? What's most helpful to you? Um, well, what we need is a lot of what they're doing, and that is um, producing guidance for how to manage patients, how to um, do things like com um, community mitigation to slow the spread of disease. So we're getting lots of information on, on the most up-to-date ways to, to, to control the spread of disease in populations. Um, there's also funding. Funding's always important for a response uh, during an emergency. Um, that's, uh, you know, at Congress right now and getting approved. I don't actually know the stage it's in, but we have had communications that we're going to be receiving some excess funding that we then will apply to uh, this emergency response. Now, the governor has mentioned that she has the capability to authorize um, about three-quarters of a million dollars, it sounds like, in the case of an emergency. That's great, and the governor's been, um, as you've seen on the news yesterday, but just um, behind the scenes as well, very supportive um, in this response um, to assure that we have the adequate resources we need um, for our population. Um, you've been with, you said, the Department of Health since 2002, right? Yes, off and on. Okay. Yes. Um, the, during that time, there has been established a, what's called a pandemic influenza plan. Mm -hmm. um, and you were telling me that that informs to a large extent um, what the state does in situations like this, um, but also sort of lays out what it can do. Um, are there scenarios in which the state would ask school districts to close down? So regarding the pandemic influenza plan, we call it that, but it is a plan that you can adapt to other viruses and other pathogens that are causing widespread disease. And spread so, similarly. And spread similarly. Okay. And so, yes, we are updating that plan regularly and using the components that are appropriate to use for this novel coronavirus. Um, specifically around school closures, there, there um, are parts of that plan as well as guidance from uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention regarding school closures. And we've seen some of those, um, as you may have seen in the news recently in the state of Washington and other places around the world. So we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a connected world. We will monitor how that's worked in those areas and then decide what's best for the state of New Mexico. Okay. Um, the department is holding a couple of, or actually three, um, community meetings. Um, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the decision um, to hold those meetings on Thursday in Clovis, Roswell, and Las Cruces, gathering people together to tell them about a communicable disease? Well, so as we uh, discussed, uh, our, as we need to mention, there are no confirmed cases in the state of New Mexico. Um, so it is, um, you know, important for us to get our message out. One of the ways to do that is to bring people together, communicate directly. Um, we would not be doing that should we have widespread um, uh, you know, disease in, in our communities. However, we're not at that point. So I think communicating directly to people is important, as well as getting our message out through other means. So we have a web page that people can go to. 
um, that's both specific for New Mexico as well as has a lot of links to the guidance from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And we'll make sure to get that up on our web page too. You. Um, you said uh, no confirmed cases, two tests as of yesterday. One was negative and the other one is pending still, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I don't have a result for that one today or this morning. Okay. Um, the, but I would like to say that yes. we are doing quite a bit more testing. Okay. So we, um, we have a, um, many more tests that are pending at our state laboratory. Um, and we have a system in place for monitoring viruses in general. Um, we use it mostly for influenza, but as I said before, with, and similar to the pandemic influenza plan, we can adapt it to monitor what viruses are circulating um, throughout the state. Okay. Um, the, the first test was taken two weeks ago. Um, from what I understand. Um, how much does the public need to know? Um, is there a, a good reason to sort of keep that under wraps for those two weeks? Um, how much should the public know about the number of people being tested? Um, and what are the, I guess, the benefits and the risks of imparting that information? Yeah, so I, first of all, the governor's message again yesterday was a really good one. It's not time to panic, it's time to be prepared and, okay. so, and to prepare further. Um, so when you tell people you're testing for something, they get it somewhat excited. Sure. We don't want to keep it from them, but we want to communicate a good message. Um, the other thing is, is that we wouldn't ever want, if we're really worried about the disease, the general public or others descending upon that area for whatever reason, we would want people to not necessarily stay completely away, but, but to keep their social distance. And so if we have a, a case detected in the state of New Mexico, we are going to put that message out as soon as we possibly can after that is confirmed. Okay. And when you talk about uh, people descending upon an area, um, is, is this a scenario like, you, like we've seen in Washington State where, where there are a number of people in the same facility? No, I'm just really talking about if, if people want a story or they're curious. Um, and I don't really think that's a very Im important part of what I was saying. Okay, okay. Um, I, I think just, you know, it's important to communicate clearly to people during an emergency. And we don't want something else getting in the way, hysteria, a panic, whatever it is. But I assure you, if we have a case confirmed in the state of New Mexico, that will be made public and we will provide much more messaging around it. Um, so that people understand what's going on. And the governor seemed to indicate yesterday that that seems likely that we'll get a case. Well, I think that what we've seen around the world is that there is spread. And so there certainly is potential in, in the state of New Mexico. Thankfully, we haven't seen it yet. And that's why we need to prepare. So if it, if it does come, we need to be prepared. Dr. Smelser, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.